This is StoryLink Radio. Our stories are presented before a live audience, then recorded for the StoryLink Radio podcast for your on-demand listening pleasure. Please visit StoryLinkRadio.com for show notes, to find out how to join our live audience, and for lots of free stuff, including free audiobooks and much more. If you enjoy the following prologue and would like to hear more of this story, please visit our website and comment on this episode. Visit www.storylinkradio.com. This introduction to Selkies is in part from Sigurd Tauri. The mythological origin of the Selkie folk is not clear. Some said that they were fallen angels who were condemned to become seals, while others said that they were once human beings who, for some grave misdemeanor, were were doomed to assume the form of a seal and live out the rest of their days in the sea. When angels fell, some fell on the land, some on the sea. The former are the fairies, and the latter were often said to be the seals. Now seals, or selkies, heads bobbing above the waves, watch us inquisitively with uncannily human eyes. The islands have numerous stories relating to the selkie folk. Unlike the thin folk, The Selkies are not malicious creatures, but rather gentle shapeshifters with the ability to transform from seals into beautiful, live humans. Once in their human form, the Selkies will dance merrily on the moonlit seashore or bask on island rocks. When a Selkie assumes human form, they shed their seal skins. Now if for any reason they lose their skins, or it is stolen from them, They are unable to change back and are trapped in their human form. When in their human form, the Selkie will guard their skin carefully. If they are disturbed during a midnight dances, they will quickly snatch up their skin and rush back to the safety of the sea. The male members of the Selkies seem to have many encounters with human females, both married and unmarried. A Selkie man in a human form is... Well, as a handsome creature indeed, with almost magical, seductive powers over mortal women. Selkie men have no qualms in shedding their skins, hiding them carefully, and heading inland to seek illicit intercourse with an uh, unsatisfied woman. Now, should any mortal woman wish to make contact with a Selkie man, she need only shed seven tears into the sea at high tide. Now, while selkie men are attractive to earth-born women, oh, the selkie females are certainly no less alluring to the eyes of the island men. There are many tales of young men who either trick or steal a selkie girl's sealskin to prevent her from returning to the sea. They then force the beautiful maiden to marry them, very often then having children with her. Often in the old tales, The selkie woman's children may find and return her skin to her so that she may return to her home in the sea. She may take her children with her, or in some tales she may watch over her land-bound children for the rest of their lives. Often these children will feel a, a bond to the sea and will make successful lives upon the waters, oft times with protection and guidance from their selkie mother. Now this next prologue is an introduction to the story the Secret of Roan Moore Scary by Rosalie K. Fry. That's uh, Scary, S K E R R Y, by the way, which is a little rocky island. Now, the wonderful movie, The Secret of Roan Inish, is based on this book. We hope you enjoy this introduction, and if you'd like to hear more of the story, please let us know in your comments. You can find notes on this story, including where to buy the book and the movie, and read more stories of the Selkies in the show notes on our website www.storylinkradio.com Prologue to Secret of Roan More Scary White-capped waves scudded before the wind, tumbling over one another in their hurry to fling themselves on a little steamer heading out from the coast of Scotland toward the Western Isles. But she was a stout little ship, accustomed to these wild seas, and as each wave struck her, she shook herself like a terrier tossing the spray back over her decks as she rose to meet the next. The passengers huddled below, sheltering from the wind in the flying spray. All that is, except one. A child stood alone in the bow like a little figurehead. 
She was slight and small for a ten-year-old, with eyes as gray as the restless waves and red-gold hair that streamed on the wind like a flame. On the top button of her old brown coat fluttered a battered label on which was her name, Fiona McConville. And yet she was not quite alone after all, for several seagulls drifted about her, easily keeping abreast of the ship as they glided along on the wind. Their outspread wings were motionless, but their watchful eyes missed nothing. And with a sudden wave tossed its spray into the air, they swept up out of reach with a twist of their wings, then glided along as before. Out there in the bow of the plunging ship, the child felt herself in a world of her own with the seagulls and the leaping waves. She was startled when a strange voice spoke behind her. She spun around and saw a young sailor making his way toward her along the slippery deck. Or do you live in the Isles, then? he asked her. Or are you going out there for a holiday? Well, I used to live here. I, I was born on one of the Isles, you see. But we left four years ago when I was six, and we went away to live in a city. Oh, <laughs> well, you're certainly getting your fill of sea air today. <laughs> he laughed as another wave hit the little ship, sprinkling them with spray. Uh, and which, uh, which was the island where you used to live then? Oh, um, Roan Moor was its name, said Fiona. Roan Moor, oh. He exclaimed on such a queer, sharp note of surprise that she asked curiously, Why is, is there something special about that island? Well, uh, he began a little hesitantly, uh, they are tales, you know, uh, uh, strange tales. Well, what, what, what sort of tales? urged Fiona, drawing closer. Well, uh, you see, the, the island is that's quite deserted nowadays, uh, has been ever since it was evacuated four years ago. Uh, the, the empty cottages are crumbling into ruins, and, well, nobody goes there anymore except the seagulls and the great grey seals. And, uh, yet, they do say, um, Oh, what do they say? breathed Fiona, her grey eyes very wide. Ah, well, well, they say that fishermen passing after dark have seen lights in those cottage windows and caught the tang of a driftwood fire when the wind is off the shore. And there are other uh, stranger stories. Ah, but there, maybe it's only talking, and I must get back to my work. He turned on his heel and was gone before she could ask him more. Now, for the hundredth time, Fiona wondered if perhaps somewhere among the islands she would find her little lost brother, Jamie. Oh, Jamie had been such a beautiful baby, sitting up in his wooden cradle, gazing at her with great dark eyes, so very unlike her own. She remembered the day when he learned to walk and how she had claimed him then as her own special playmate, teaching him all the games she knew and inventing new ones for his amusement. She smiled at the thought of the parties they gave on the kitchen floor with a, a tea set made of shells collected from the beach. Oh, and then with a sigh, Fiona thought of the terrible day when they had all deserted the island. She remembered the blue of the morning sea and the crying of the seagulls on the wind, while across the bay on the scary, the great grey seals lifted their heads and moaned as though sorry to see the islanders go. Thank you for listening to Storylink Radio. If you like what you've just heard, we hope you will subscribe to our podcast and pass along our web address, www.storylinkradio.com. Be sure to visit our website for show notes to find out how to join our live audience and for lots of free stuff, including free audiobooks and much more. Join us next time for another story from Storylink Radio.